is my it truly is my pleasure and honor to be with you all tonight. I know we all have so many choices about uh, these talks that we can attend these days via Zoom. It's wonderful. And I'm just very pleased that you're here with me tonight. I'm planning to tell you a story, the story of the diseased ship. And this is a main story, even if much of it, as you'll hear tonight, centers on Boston. I really look forward to talking with you all in the Q&A. Um, so I hope you'll keep your questions uh, and stick around. If you had been standing on Boston's Long Wharf 202 years ago, on August 1st, 1819, you would have smelled it long before you saw it. The putrid odor that blew into the harbor that day made the entire city sick to its stomach. Dock workers accustomed to unpleasant odors suddenly found themselves doubled over wrapped in a sickly embrace, so suffocating, they would talk about it for years to come. Even customs agents up in their stately offices, they were not spared the revolting stench. Merchants, laundress makers, caulkers, street kids, if you were human and you had a nose, you couldn't help but stop whatever it was you were doing to scan the horizon for the source of the corruption. And then it appeared, the 10 brothers, the long awaited tall ship belonging to some of the biggest names in Boston shipping, Humphrey, Lyman, Dodge, Thorndike, the sons of New England's wealthiest, most influential merchant traders, at least one of whom had made a significant part of his fortune in the slave trade. When they launched this joint venture 11 months earlier, this group of trust fund kids had expected it to reap major profits. And now their ship had finally come in. Only, mortifyingly, it reeked to high heaven. And from an investor's point of view, there was very little cargo in the hold. Mostly, it was just stones and ballast. It's a matter of common remark that no ship has arrived in our harbor for many years in so foul a state as the 10 brothers, attested one witness. It has been stated by people of veracity that the ship was extremely foul, echoed another, so as to be offensive to the senses even when coming up the harbor. What exactly had happened on board this ship after its crew of Cape Cod men pulled anchor and sailed for Sierra Leone 11 months earlier on September 1st, 1818? What cargo had the vessel carried from West Africa to the West Indies? And what could have imbued its every timber with a putrescence so revolting that no amount of scrubbing or fumigating could successfully mask the hor horrific stench? Within days of the ship's return to Boston following its 11 month voyage, the population's disgust would turn to terror as sailors and dock workers, customs officials, and anyone having had contact with a ship turned a shocking shade of yellow and started to bleed from every orifice before dying in contorted fits of agony. One 19th century commentator offered an account that might sound eerily familiar to us today. Now that we've all witnessed the devastating impact of COVID-19 on communities in the greater Boston area. There were instances in Boston the last summer where one after another in a family was suffered to sicken and die with scarcely a friend to administer the medicine which was prescribed by the physician. Neighbors were afraid to aid each other, although in reality exposed to the same common danger and brother was afraid to visit brother. Strangers closed the eyes of the dying and hurried them to the grave as soon as the last breath was drawn. 200 years ago, 
a collective tragedy played out right here in coastal New England, much like the one that we're currently experiencing on a global scale. Only in the summer of 1819, it was not the coronavirus that was wreaking havoc on the population. It was the yellow fever virus. And incredibly, just as investigators today have been able to trace the source of Boston's 2020 outbreak of COVID-19 to the fateful Biogen conference that took place at the Long Wharf Marriott Hotel. Well, that was the first super spreader event in the US, if you recall. In that same way, the source of the yellow fever outbreak that ravaged Boston's waterfront two centuries ago was patently obvious to public health officials of the day. There it was, tied up at the end of that very same Long Wharf like some malignant Trojan horse. The entire city pointed to the ship 10 brothers and accused the vessel of carrying a plague in the place of a cargo. While a lot of folks have turned to history for answers about how we might handle our present challenges, most have sought to draw lessons from the devastating influenza pandemic of 1918. So we need to ask, why is no one talking about the epidemic that took place 100 years earlier? And the answer is, it was left out of the history books. So as I tell you the story of the disease ship, one that I dug up in my hometown and have spent the past couple of years reconstructing, I'd like you to ask yourselves a couple of questions. How could a story as big as this one have been omitted from the historical record? and entirely forgotten. What does this oversight suggest about the way New England's history was written? What does it tell us about the way our regional identity was constructed? And finally, a broader question, does it matter that we know our history? So let me start with a confession. Five years ago, I had never heard of the 10 brothers, although it's captain and crew all hailed from my hometown on Cape Cod, Brewster. Nor did I know the first thing about New England's role in the slave trade. My training was in literature, not history. But everything changed one day when I decided to take a shortcut through the cemetery in my old childhood neighborhood. And I happened upon a white marble headstone where it was inscribed, Benjamin Crosby died in Africa. 1795, at the age of 27. Africa, I thought. What had Crosby been doing there? I myself had spent six years in West Africa straight out of college. And although I was cautious not to jump to any conclusions, I felt quite certain, seeing this headstone, that my motivations in going to Africa had been quite different from those of Benjamin Crosby. Could this man have been involved in the slave trade? I wondered. Well, I went to the library. And though I do know how to do research, I dug and I dug and I found absolutely no books on the topic of Cape Cod's relationship to Africa. I went to the Historical Society and asked everyone uh, who would speak to me, were the Cape Cod sea captains involved in the slave trade? I got no definitive answers. I went to the town hall and to the historic town vaults where I spent days and days poring over my town's records going all the way back to 1700 and suffering the cold stare of the town clerk who wasn't very pleased that I was doing this. I asked my friends and my family, anyone who would listen in fact, and finally, I learned that our town's most prominent sea captain had sailed to Africa and I was in luck. He had written a memoir and here he is. The man who actually literally created my hometown in 1803 by engineering its secession from the town of Harwich. His memoir was published by Yale University Press in 1925. 
And the house that he built back in 1799 went uh, it over it underwent a major million dollar restoration and became home to the Brewster Historical Society just a couple years ago. From rags to riches, Elijah Cobb's story reads like a typical Horatio Alger novel, and you may be familiar with the genre. Boy born into poverty manages to overcome his humble beginnings with grit, wit, courage, determination. And if you add to that list luck and charm and good looks, well, you've got Elijah Cobb. This Brewster boy had gone off to sea at the age of 15. And by the time his own son came along, he had already amassed a small fortune. He was uh, honored in many ways over the years with titles and uh, appointments. Between voyages and after retiring from the sea in 1820, Elijah Cobb managed to serve my hometown in just about every capacity imaginable. He was town treasurer and town clerk, inspector general, justice of the peace, representative and senator to the Massachusetts legislature, and as a member of the militia, he even climbed to the rank of Brigadier General. These achievements are all the more impressive when you consider that at the age of six, Cobb's father died at sea and his mother sent him to live with another family in town where he was forced to do hard labor to earn his keep. In other words, Cobb was bound out. It's entirely possible, by the way, that Elijah Cobb could have served as a source of inspiration for the prolific novelist Horatio Alger, whose dime novels for boys could be found in virtually every American household during the Gilded Age. The Chelsea-born author would have been intimately familiar with Cobb's story, actually, because before getting his start as a novelist, Horatio Alger spent two years in Brewster as minister of the First Parish Church, just a few years after the sea captain's death. And I dare say that someone so invested in the possibility of rising from humble beginnings to glory would have recognized in Cobb's upward mobility the very stuff of the American dream that Alger helped to articulate. Here, in Cobb was a true self-made man, you could say. In Cobb's memoir, he tells us about his first overseas voyage to Suriname, about trading in the West Indies, about his travels between Southern American ports during his coasting years, as he calls them. And in some ways you could say that he doesn't hold back. He admits to all sorts of illegal and unscrupulous acts that made him a favorite among Boston's shipping elite. He smuggles contraband. He cheats the embargo. He bribes his way into and out of European ports. He outruns the British Navy. He even manages to get a private meeting with Robespierre at the height of the reign of terror following France's revolution. Anything, anything to secure big returns on his employer's investments. In bragging about these exploits, Cobb comes off as a bit of a rogue, but a fairly charming one. In fact, he's just the sort of character featured in so many Hollywood blockbusters who we idolize for their pluck and cunning, their willingness to risk anything for the love of the chase. But let's not mistake Bragadaccio for full disclosure. Cobb's memoir is just as notable for what it does not tell us. There is a significant portion of the sea captain's career that we never learn about in his memoir because he breaks off before he can describe his final eight years sailing the world between 1812 and 1820. In a note that must have accompanied the first printed edition of Cobb's memoir in 1857, his grandson explains that the sea captain's health prevented him from recounting the rest of his overseas adventures. And it's certainly possible, right, that ill health was the main obstacle. After all, 
The man was 75 when he set down the bulk of his memories. But this explanation creates the impression that Cobb grew physically incapable of finishing his memoir. And that is certainly not the case. He was still writing letters to his granddaughters in 1845, two years after he stopped writing his memoir. So we have to ask, what really caused Cobb to end the story of his seafaring career eight years early? Well, let's look at what he left out. The disastrous 10 Brothers Voyage, the story of how he sailed into Boston's harbor in July of 1819 to complete a triangular journey that had all the characteristics of a slaving voyage. Letters that appeared in the 1925 edition of his memoir testify to at least two African voyages, one in 1818 and another that wrapped up in 1819. But when a new streamlined version of the memoir was published in 2011, those letters were left out so that no mention is made at all of any African voyages. I believe that the only reason we know that Cobb made these African voyages at all is because he caused a public health crisis in Boston. By all accounts, this vessel was big and beautiful and fast. I will draw your attention to the fact that it was built in Sullivan, Maine, just a short sail up the coast from here. Prior to being purchased by Boston-based merchants, the Ten Brothers was registered, in fact, in Bangor. Its crew was made up of men and boys from my hometown's greatest seafaring families. All of the most important names are here represented. Cobb was not the captain at the outset of this voyage, you will see. He was supercargo, which means he was responsible for conducting trade, deciding what the vessel carried uh, as cargo to sell and what uh, what it would sell once it arrived at destination and for what cost. This, if you look at the this uh, configuration, you see that this voyage represents uh, the strong ties that existed between Brewster and Boston. Most Brewster men, in fact, sailed out of Boston and they were quite prized by Boston shipping magnates. There was a second vessel sailing in consort with the 10 brothers, and that was the schooner Hope. This vessel was also built in Maine. Um, it was in Phippsburg, in fact, and registered out of Bath the very year that this voyage took place. It was enrolled in Bath in 1818. Here, the captain is David Nickerson. Uh, and we know that Isaac Clark was on this vessel serving as supercargo. Isaac Clark and Elijah Cobb were best friends. It was the two of them who had worked together to um, declare independence, if you will, for the town of Brewster from, from Harwich. He, Clark was uh, running the town of Brewster at the time this voyage took place. He was very comfortable. He'd retired from the sea, but the story goes that Cobb, his best friend, managed to tempt him out of retirement and coax him along on this journey uh, by essentially telling him, we're going to make a lot of money very fast and you'll be comfortable in your retirement as will all of your family members. You'll notice that we know very little about the other crew members on board this vessel. Uh, this is common in uh, New England maritime history. There are great gaping holes in our records. Sometimes they say it's because the records went up in flames. 
in great fires at the Customs House, whether it's here in Portland or in Boston in 1872. Uh, but also, we know for a fact, scholars will assure you that many records were, uh, were disappeared, actively thrown overboard, um, and hidden from the authorities. So I'll just um, note here that these two vessels sailing in consort, this is another characteristic typical of a slaving voyage. You would often have a larger vessel sailing with a smaller vessel uh, as a tender, serving as a tender or auxiliary vessel carrying, for example, the food that would be used to, um, to feed the, the captive Africans along the journey. There is another relationship between David Nickerson and Elijah Cobb that I'd like to draw your attention to. Both worked as captains of another vessel, the Monsoon, earlier in their careers. So we don't know whether they were on board the Monsoon when it served as a slaving vessel, but thanks to the really important website uh, and database slavevoyages.org, we do know that this very vessel did serve at least twice as a slaving vessel. I'll draw your attention to the number of enslaved Africans that died en route, 66 out of a total of 267. Why were they dying? I can't tell you in particular in this case, but frequently it was due to lack of uh, enough food, enough water. It was due to diseases such as uh, yellow fever, cholera, typhoid, dysentery. It was due to suicide. It was due to mutiny. So there are some other things that this really important site, slavevoyages.org, can tell us, and I think it's worth pausing here for a moment. According to slavevoyages.org, there were 1,740 known transatlantic slaving voyages out of New England. So this is what is currently known. There is much that we have yet to uncover, and that is the work of scholars uh, in this emerging field of, of research, such as my colleague, Kate McMahon. Uh, and it is the work of Atlantic Black Box, which is encouraging citizen historians to participate in uncovering this history that has for so long been suppressed. But already we know that this number represent this number represents, you know, those voyages we do know of, but these are the transatlantic voyages Let's not forget, New Englanders were deeply involved in domestic slave trading. So moving captive Africans or African Americans, for example, from uh, the Upper South to the Lower South after slave trading was banned by the federal government in 1808. The journey of the, the 10 brothers began on September 1st, 1818. That's when it departed for the west coast of Africa, and it, uh, its first port was Sierra Leone. This too is characteristic of a slaving voyage out of New England. Um, so an itinerary, which you'll later see, a triangular itinerary across the Atlantic from uh, the Americas to West Africa, then to the West Indies and back to, to New England. That triangular that we we often refer to that as the the triangle trade, right? Um, but you'll tell me this could not have been a slaving voyage, right? Because here we are in 1818, the federal government had passed a, a law in 1808 pro prohibiting transatlant the transatlantic slave trade, and. More importantly, uh, Massachusetts, because Maine, of course, was still part of Massachusetts at the time. So Massachusetts had outlawed slave trading much earlier in 1788. So no one from our ports of Boston or Portland or, um, or Freeport was meant to be slave trading at this point. 
The reality is, the tragic reality is that illicit slave trading went on well past the prohibition in 1808. In fact, as Kate McMahon's research shows, it went on right through the Civil War. The cargo that this, these vessels carried was also typical of a slaving voyage. It carried um, tobacco, rum, cloth, and hardware, which could very well have meant weapons, guns, cannons. The first port was Lomboco in Sierra Leone. And this was prime slaving country. Slave trading was the main industry here and the illegal trade thrived here because largely US vessels could not be boarded by the British Navy. Uh, there was a sovereignty at sea clause in, uh, in the Naval Acts, um, which prevented Brits from boarding unless they saw uh, right, right there visibly on board on, on the upper decks, uh, captive Africans. So this was an area known commonly as the white man's grave. You may have heard the expression. Uh, it was very deadly to uh, white mariners from New England, mainly due to the prevalence of yellow fever. However, many mariners continued to consider that the risk, the high mortality uh, rate, um, and these risks were worth uh, the taking the risk because the trade was so lucrative. Lomboco, of course, was not only a place of death for white mariners from uh, America or from, in, from uh, rather Europe, the slave fort of Lomboco was known as a capital of cruelty, a place of mass death. So whether or not Captain Elijah Cobb um, and his crew were trading in slaves. Doing any business here, they would have not only witnessed these horrors, but they would have been complicit in them. So departing Sierra Leone, these two vessels, they sail on uh, along the West African coast towards Ghana. What were they trading in? Uh, well, they claimed they were after ivory and gold, gold dust. Maybe that's, maybe that's true, right? We need to ask the question, was there legitimate trading going on during this period? Well, again, this is one of those questions that we need uh, more scholarship to properly answer. However, existing studies tell us that what's considered legitimate trade, in other words, not involving a human cargo, um, mainly took place later in the 19th century, and it was concentrated more, more uh, northward along the West African coast in the Senegambia region, for example. Down here, the primary objective of vessels doing trade here was to purchase captive Africans. So the vessel then uh, moves on they would have no doubt seen Ghana's Elmina slave castle before then leaving the coast for Principe, uh, which they called Prince's Island. And here it is. It is now an island nation uh, together with Sao Tome. Uh, these were Portuguese holdings from a very early date. Cobb and his companions would have seen these images, uh, these vestiges of the Portuguese plantations where sugar and coffee were grown primarily, plantations that were run entirely on slave labor. So why was Principe a favored port for European mariners? Well, because uh, being off the coast of West Africa, there was less disease, fewer infectious diseases to contend with. So 
we need to pause here and really dig uh, m deeper into this question of what commodities these New Englanders were in fact after. So the earlier voyage, the one that took place in 1818 that I mentioned, uh, when, when Cobb returned, he, he claimed that his object there in that case had been gold dust and ivory. But this time around, when Cobb wrote to his wife justifying his long absence, and he wrote to her from Principe, Prince's Island. He said, I, I'm going to be late, honey. I'm going to be a few months late coming home. Don't worry. It's just that I'm waiting for the coffee crop to be harvested. So in the shipping news that was published, which you can see here, uh, when the vessel returned to Boston, here you can see that the cargo is stated to have been ivory and coffee. So, okay, that, uh, that corresponds to his claim in his letter to his wife that he was buying coffee at Prince's Island. And he could have bought the cargo, the ivory, uh, at some other point along that West African coast. But let's think about this from an economic standpoint for a minute. Okay. When the vessel returned to Boston, it was not carrying a commercial cargo of either of these commodities, not a commercial cargo of ivory or of coffee. What officials found were a number of bags of coffee, not very many, that were full of bugs and putrid, rotting, okay? Um, and Again, it's highly unusual that a vessel would arrive back in Boston from the West Indies, for example, mostly stones in ballast, that is without a, a return cargo. Um, because you don't want to sail stones in ballast, you wanna make money at every leg along the journey, right? So now we have to think, okay, they purchased something in West Africa, they went to the West Indies and they sold whatever they had bought in Africa. And when they got back to Boston, they had hardly anything in the cargo hold. So what was it that they sold in Martinique, in the West Indies? Did they sell ivory? There was no market for ivory in the West Indies. Could Cobb have sold coffee in the West Indies? Well, no, he could not have. Why? Because they grow coffee in the West Indies. It's one of the major crops alongside sugar. So it really makes no economic sense, right? What was it then that he sold in the West Indies? So when these vessels arrived back in Boston, I'm kind of skipping ahead in the story for a moment. When they arrive back in Boston and investigators come on board um, to assess the vessel, they discover a few years of, a few ears of putrid corn. They're stuffed up into the timbers between decks. And they ask him about it, Captain Cobb. Well, Cobb says, that, that is the cargo that we purchased in, in Principe, in Africa. And that is what we sold in Martinique. He says it was Indian corn. Okay, let's think about that. Uh, Indian corn is native to New England. The trade route between uh, Britain's Northern colonies prior to US independence uh, down to its southern colonies in the Caribbean, that was a well-worn trade route. In fact, this is how New England uh, really gained its economic um, it, it, its economic footing in the 17th, 18th centuries was by provisioning those colonies of the West Indies with everything needed to run the plantations in Barbados and Jamaica and Martinique, Antigua, all throughout the West Indies. These islands had been clear cut. There was a monoculture of sugar 
because demand was so great, our sweet tooth was so great uh, that uh, sugar was an extremely lucrative product. And New England sold to the West Indies salt cod, salt herring, timber, hardware, grains, livestock, everything in fact needed to run those plantations um, because, because they were so busy producing sugar that they weren't producing those crops on their own. So, so corn, a smart um, trader such as Cobb, who had spent 40 years at sea by this point, would he have sailed all the way to West Africa to buy Indian corn in order to sell it in the West Indies? Um, or would he rather, if that were his objective, would he not have bought his Indian corn right here in New England and just sailed it straight down the coast? Short trip, it's less expensive, it's less dangerous, right? It takes less time. Um, so that claim that he went to West Africa essentially to buy a cargo of Indian corn, that too seems bunk. I will note here that corn was one of those grains the most commonly used uh, on board slaving vessels uh, to, to feed the captives. It was ground up into a sort of a gruel. So that could explain the presence of Indian corn on the vessels. So back at Principe now. They're in the harbor and suddenly captains and crew start getting sick. People uh, on the shipping all around them start dropping like flies. They recognize it when they see it. This is uh, an outbreak of yellow fever. They don't know that the cause is the uh, mosquito, uh, that the, the vector uh, for the virus is the Aedes aegypti mosquito, but they certainly recognize the symptoms of yellow fever. They're very distinctive. So Elijah Cobb is in great distress. On February 7th, the boy, Kimball, is the first to die of yellow fever. Four days later, his best friend, Isaac Clark, the man who I said was running the town of Brewster, who was in retirement, he died. Seven days later, Joseph Mayo Jr., who was captain of the 10 brothers, died. Captain Nickerson of the Hope, he uh, got very ill and was completely incapacitated. So Cobb was right to panic. He would have recognized this as an outbreak of yellow fever that was ravaging his crews. So what did he do in this situation? Well, he decided uh, to take command of the 10 brothers. He appointed a man named John Dillingham to command the Hope. He told John Dillingham, leave, uh, sail, uh, sail back to the Americas. What we don't know is the specific instructions he gave him, uh, but the Hope, this is where the vessels parted ways. The Hope went on, uh, sailed off uh, to the West Indies, um, and arrived back in Boston two months before the 10 brothers did. Elijah Cobb um, made a different choice for the vessel he was commanding. <clears throat> now, Boston's Board of Health, uh, when they later conducted their investigation, they concluded that Cobb's actions in the face of this horror that I've described for you were not only responsible, they were heroic. So let's consider the choices that he made. So now four men have, have died, four very you know, uh, important men for uh, conducting this voyage. Um, Cobb himself gets sick, but he recovers. He had probably developed some kind of immunity to yellow fever uh, early on in his career. 
So he's not going to leave his money on the table. He does not want to leave the area before he has completed his transaction at Principe. Uh, so instead, he sails off a bit, goes a bit uh, further out to sea to get away from the sickly harbor, as he calls it. Um, after a month, the vessel returns to conclude its commerce. So in full knowledge of the risk, they're sailing right back to the sickly harbor. And the 10 brothers then spends another two months moving between Principe and San Tome uh, conducting business. And so putting the lives of the crew once again at risk and more die, more men die as a result. For what? Indian corn, Cobb says. Is he really risking the lives of his men for a harvest of Indian corn or coffee? So uh, on they sail, May 19th, they depart for Martinique. As I told you, what is there? Sugar plantations, end to end. They unload, they make very quick work of unloading the cargo here, just one week at port in Martinique. Again, I emphasize, they did not take on a return cargo here. Typically, New England vessels, that's exactly what they would do. They would take on sugar and molasses, uh, and they would bring that back up to New England where distilleries would uh, convert that into rum typically, um, which could then be used uh, to in, in as, as currency in doing more trade with West Africa. Uh, but no, they didn't. Um, they left very quickly Martinique and sailed a short voyage back to Boston, just 19 days. Along the way, Cobb's nephew and namesake died between Martinique and Boston. When Cobb got back to Boston, he said it was because the kid had a cold. He had a cold. You recall that when the vessel arrived, it, it started coming up into the harbor. People smelled it for miles away, uh, probably uh, even when it was uh, anchored at Rainsford Island, also known as Quarantine Island. So vessels were obliged to perform quarantine if they were doing trade in the tropics and if that was occurring between the months of May and October. You had to go to quarantine. And the length of your stay at quarantine depended on when the last illness took place on your vessel um, or there was a specific number of days. And these regulations had been put in place, why? Because precisely of the terrible yellow fever epidemic that broke out in Philadelphia in 1793. At the time, Philadelphia was our nation's capital, very young capital, right? And all of you know the great founding fathers and such, you know, many of them were right there when this took place. It was devastating. Over 5,000 people died, and that was certainly an undercount. Uh, 20,000 people were forced to, to flee. Um, so it was following this uh, major event in the nation's history that quarantine regulations were put in place. So vessels must remain in quarantine until 25 days have elapsed since the last death. Um, now, did the 10 brothers respect this? No, it did not. Uh, given the death of Elijah Cobb Crosby, the vessel should not have been discharged from quarantine until August 5th. Well, it was discharged on August 1st. Um, and then there's another rule that Cobb broke. <laughs> this is, um, this one really gets me, the no visitors rule. It's quite obvious and self-explanatory. Quarantine Island uh, is a place 
uh, meant to quarantine people to keep them the, the potentially ill away from the healthy populations. So naturally, one would think no visitors are allowed. Well, no visitors are allowed unless they get prior approval from the Board of Health and they pay a tax and they get a permit. Uh, Cobb had a party illegally smuggled onto Rainsford Island while the 10 brothers was performing, so performing quarantine. Uh, it, this party included John Dillingham, who you may remember, he had appointed captain of the Hope. So Dillingham had arrived two months earlier. He brought him back onto Rainsford Island, brought him back onto the crew of the 10 brothers. That's curious. Why would he do that? Also in this smuggled party was his wife and his five-year-old son and his 20-year-old son and another nephew. This was highly irregular, totally illegal. Um, and what was it all for? Well, uh, I believe it was uh, the photo op. So when the vessel was cleared from quarantine, uh, it sailed on to, into Boston Harbor, docked at Long Wharf. And you can imagine crowds were there. This vessel had been long awaited, 11 months out at sea. Um, so crowds were there to welcome it back, to see what they had brought. And there on deck, they see Elijah Cobb, his wife, his sons, um, and, uh, and then a, a, a sort of a spectacle can be made of them disembarking, et cetera. This is important and I'll come back to it later as to why he would have done that. Uh, it only took a couple of days uh, before, uh, after the, the, uh, the hatches were opened for people to start falling sick in Boston. It began with members of the crew of the 10 brothers. Um, three crew members die. Uh, the customs official who had come on board to inspect the vessel, he died. Uh, anyone, in fact, who had any contact with this ship um, got sick. So very quickly, it was obvious that the vessel was the vector for this illness, for this outbreak. And again, folks would have recognized that th this was yellow fever. Why? Because the symptoms are so uh, distinctive. And so Boston's physicians, uh, while they, they still didn't understand how yellow fever was transmitted, again, they knew the symptoms, black vomit, for example. And all of these esteemed gentlemen, they went to the Board of Health and they said, we have an outbreak of yellow fever on our hands. And what did the Boston officials do? What did the Board of Health do? They tried to discredit the physicians. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. This is not yellow fever. Why would they do that? Because as soon as the city recognized that it had yellow fever in its, uh, you know, in the port, there were a lot of uh, things that it, it would need to do. Uh, namely, it would have to uh, quarantine itself. All trade would come to a screeching halt. And that was, um, the, it was through shipping that Boston's most prominent uh, men made their money. And who controlled the Board of Health? Well, the folks on the Board of Health, they were not physicians and they were not trained in medicine in any way. They were public officials who were appoint, they were political appointees, if you will, uh, subject to the influence of wealthy uh, merchant traders. I had, uh, I had, I was able to get a look at the um, internal records of Boston's Board of Health in the rare book room at uh, the Boston Public Library. The, the room itself, I, I learned, was 
closed for renovations for three years um, and only by begging um, were the librarians convinced, persuaded to um, digitize these records for me and now for, for everyone. Uh, but what you're looking at is extraordinary. Uh, there's nothing else like it in the Board of Health records. This is uh, right at the time of the yellow fever outbreak. This is a report that was submitted by Dr. Thomas Welch, who was the port physician at the time. And as you can see, it has been very carefully, painstakingly redacted, every single letter. Um, but somebody, after this redaction had been done, somebody tried to reconstitute what had been written. Um, and, and so uh, was able to ascertain that the first sentence uh, says the subscriber having heard a communication from Dr. Welch. Well, I'm really hopeful that someday science will help us to decipher what else this report says. Um, but what I was able to find were the words 10 brothers. This is most certainly about the incident. Um, and of course the port physician would have a lot to say at this moment. So why, why was this redacted by the Board of Health? What the Board of Health could not deny was that the 10 Brothers was a diseased vessel. Uh, they admitted it. There was no getting around it. Everyone could see that all of the deaths traced directly back to it. And so they declared, they passed the order, which was published for scuttling and sinking the ship. And they said, well, these orders were carried out. This was published in the Boston papers on August 11th. That must have made it quite embarrassing, I should think, when they had to come back and state now on August 17th, six days later, well, okay, so the fever's still raging um, and we're ordering once again, the removal of the ship, the 10 brothers to the opposite side of the channel and again to be scuttled and sunk. This order was complied with. Well, this is curious. Wait, if the first order was carried out and the ship was sunk just six days earlier, why are they now ordering it removed to the other side of the harbor? Was it refloated? That's odd. Kind of raised a red flag when I saw that. And then here's a third notice. So the agitation of the public mind continuing to increase and an unusual alarm existing respecting the ship, the Board of Health on further consideration on the 23rd of August passed an order, also published, directing that said ship should be removed to quarantine ground near Hospital Island, and there again scuttled and sunk. All these orders of the Board of Health were faithfully carried into effect. So now we have to imagine that the vessel was sunk, not once, not twice, but three times. Um, at the very same moment in the press, right alongside the news about the yellow fever outbreak, suddenly there's some more interesting news. There's a sea serpent in Boston Harbor. And it's very interesting to track that the sea serpent gets more media attention than the yellow fever outbreak does. Elijah Cobb was accused of two very serious crimes. First, contraband slave trading, Ill illicit slave trading, right? Um, he was also accused of knowingly bringing the plague to Boston. I do not have those accusations yet, but what I do have is Cobb's rebuttal. So the accusations against him, he must have considered that they were serious enough, uh, they were compromising enough that he couldn't ignore them. He had to address them. And so he published two letters in the Boston press. And of course, he denies, he denies uh, emphatically that he was slave trading. 
And he denies that he knew that disease was on board his vessel. And he uses all kinds of um, rhetorical strategies to make his case uh, of innocence and you know declare his innocence. But one of the very interesting uh, arguments he makes, the real zinger is, he says, would I have invited my wife and my children on board the vessel if I knew it was diseased? That would have to, that would make me a monster, basically, is what he says. Well, uh, it almost seems like inviting his wife and his children on board the vessel was a strategy, knowing that this vessel was carrying disease, and that's something he could point to later, um, precisely to try to exonerate himself from suspicion. Cobb was exonerated by the Boston Board of Health when it conducted its in investigation. They decided that this ship was not involved in the slave trade um, and that Cobb had not lied about any aspect of this voyage. In fact, the Board of Health thought everyone had done a wonderful job here, um, including themselves. They give themselves a pat on the back. They say uh, everything was done that could be done. In other words, Boston's authorities at quarantine station made no mistake by letting this vessel come to Long Wharf. Everyone was beautiful. So a couple of important claims about this voyage um, have been made over the years. Claim number one, that the 10 brothers was destroyed. Uh, there has been very little attention given to this story um, until I started researching it. Um, but there were some people in my town who, who knew that a disastrous voyage had taken place in 1819. Um, and there was one scholar who mentioned it um, as well in his study of public health in Boston. Well, everyone believed that the 10 brothers was destroyed. After all, the Board of Health said it was scuttled and sunk, right? Three times. Well, I discovered that that was not the case. And it was thanks to a simple Google search. First of all, I just Googled the 10 brothers ship and I was directed to the Peabody Essex Museum's uh, Phillips Library where a um, log book associated with the vessel 10 brothers existed. And this log book uh, had been kept by a man named Moses Bond, so not Elijah Cobb, and it was dated 1820. And I thought this can't possibly be the same 10 brothers vessel because my vessel was destroyed in 1819. Well, I went to the library and I saw the logbook and I looked in the ship registry for Boston and found it is exactly the same vessel. In fact, some of the owners, the, the folks who owned the vessel and were investors during the 1819 fiasco remained owners when the vessel then sailed on in 1820. Where did this new captain, Moses Bond, sail the 10 brothers to? Very tellingly, it was to Salvador, Brazil, Bahia the prime destination for captive Africans. So just um, to put things in perspective a little bit, here in the United States, uh, the total number of captive Africans to be brought to our shores in North America is believed to have been 500,000. Now I want you to imagine the small island of Cuba, one million, over one million Africans were enslaved and sold into slavery in Cuba alone. That's twice as many as to the, to the US. But now consider Brazil, five million captive Africans were sold into slavery in Brazil. 
The second claim that we need to consider is that the contagion was contained. Um, that the vessel was sunk and so yellow fever, uh, the yellow fever epidemic, the yellow fever uh, on board connected to the vessel didn't cause uh, an epidemic. And that I discovered was absolutely not the case either. Uh, New York was devastated by an outbreak uh, which followed quickly um, after Boston's and it shut down all of lower Manhattan. It caused extreme disruption to trade and all human activity in New York. And the New York authorities, they pointed directly at Boston and at the 10 brothers and they said, you gave us your plague. You should have quarantined yourselves. The epidemic spread to Charleston. Uh, by September, there were already 105 deaths. This is very low numbers. Okay, these are definitely not reflective of actual mortality rates. But imagine that in Charleston, the the um, the period of yellow fever is it's a it, it can go on a lot longer than in a city like Boston because it's carried by mosquitoes. Um, so here in the in the Northeast, a frost will kill off those mosquitoes. Not so in Charleston, the season is much longer. Baltimore reported 2,287 deaths from the epidemic of 1819. It was a major catastrophe for the city, which became a tent city. Uh, they, there were so many who had to flee uh, the affected portions of the city um, that they had a, verit a veritable uh, humanitarian crisis on their hands. But really, you could call this a, an Atlantic world pandemic in the year 1819, because it hit every major port along the eastern seaboard, but also made its way back across the Atlantic to Spain, which really hadn't happened in many decades. Spain hadn't known an outbreak of yellow fever in quite a long time. What did the Board of Health say in response to all of this? At the end of their report, they basically shrugged. They said, diseases are heaven's messengers. Basically, this is God at work, which I find you know, strange for a Board of Health whose, um, whose mission and mandate is precisely to prevent this sort of thing from happening. And it strikes me as uh, sort of the very depths of disingenuousness. Meanwhile, back in Brewster, Elijah Cobb uh, returned home, as did his wife and sons. Um, and you have to wonder, he returned home, but so many other men from this uh, who were on this voyage from this little town did not return home. They had died along the way. In fact, seven Brewster men died as a result of this voyage. Were their families angry with Cobb with the decisions that he'd made? Did they hold him accountable? No, they didn't because it was precisely when he returned from this voyage that Cobb was covered in honors. You might even say he was whitewashed or covered up and that this was uh, something that the whole town participated in. A conspiracy of silence grew up around Cobb and around this entire, uh, this entire episode. And that's how we came to forget it. Elijah Cobb's headstone is in the cemetery of uh, the Lower Road Cemetery in my town, which holds uh, the graves of many shipmasters um, who died overseas. It's actually right next to the headstone carved by my own father uh, for our own family members. They, they sit there side by side and on Cobb's headstone, you can read the end of an upright man is peace.
I'm going to stop talking now and I am going to invite your questions and comments. Uh, you've been very patient with me as I've shared this story. What do you think? We'll open it up now to people that may have questions. If you have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, well, I have a question in regards to his education. Uh, was he, uh, uh, I noticed you, he was uh, signed off as an Esquire, mm -hmm. which is a common term for lawyer. Mm -hmm. Did he attend any? Uh, he did not. No. No, he did not. And uh, I've often wondered, you know, because Isaac Clark as well, the supercargo from the schooner Hope also, uh, is noted in the records as Esquire. Um, was that honorific, something that they could just acquire over years of serving in, in uh, you know, as, as merchant traders? Um, but there was no, no, there was no formal training for Elijah Cobb. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions uh, out there? Well, the other question I had was, uh, did you happen to get down to the uh, islands um, to see what kind of uh, ship manifest they had at, that disembarked from the uh, 10? I, I would love to do that. And I would love to hope that uh, those records continue to exist somewhere. Um, you know, piecing together a story like this is, it requires, it does require a lot of travel um, to various sites because of the very fragmented nature of the archive. Sadly, in the case of Martinique, um, you know, it was, a, it was a French colonial holding um, and, uh, and continues in fact to be part of France. Um, it's an overseas uh, territory. But so in the case of Martinique, the, the, the very port of Saint-Pierre where uh, this, these vessels, um, or at least the 10 brothers, uh, disembarked its cargo, that port was destroyed by a volcanic eruption in 1931, I believe. It was the records. <laughs> the records might have gone up, yeah, been, been embalmed in, in, you know, lava. Um, but, but they may be somewhere in the French colonial archive back in Paris. Uh, oh. So maybe I should take up a collection and see who wants to send me to Paris. <laughs> do you have a question, Fran? I'm gonna, do you wanna unmute yourself? It wasn't a question so much as just an observation is that, uh, you know, a hundred and some odd years ago and greed was still motivating commerce and, and the economy. Just like today, you mean? It's just like today, yes, and nothing <laughs> yeah. has changed. I mean, nothing people are changed. still, who's, who, who are the rich guys are, are running the show and uh, doing what they want and getting away with it. I mean, mm. they got away, he got away with uh, a tremendous amount of, of well, I, I don't even know the right word. <laughs> Maybe crimes against humanity. Crimes, it was crimes against humanity and, and against his own uh, country or townsmen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, he, he, he had to know what he was going into and he had to know what he was doing. And he did it anyway. And he, he got his friend because he said, will make a whole lot of money very fast. Yeah. And that was what the slave trade was doing, was making a whole lot of money very fast for the people who were, who were embarking in it. Mm -hmm. So true. Mary, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Oops, got to unmute. I don't have a question. I just think it's fascinating. 
I mean, this whole history that we didn't know anything about, or I never know anything about it, that it's really, it's amazing. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Yeah, and I saw Pat had her hand up there. Yeah, please, Pat. Meadow, I, I joined a little, maybe five or 10 minutes um, after you started. So you may have addressed this initially. How did you get in, interested in this subject matter? Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I have had a lifelong interest in Africa and African-American folklore and stories. And, um, and I, I lived in, in Senegal, West Africa for, for six years, but I never thought that there was a connection between my, my, my home, you know, my birthplace on Cape Cod and my adoptive home across the Atlantic. Um, I, you know, and so it was absolutely by accident. I was just walking through a cemetery and I happened to see a headstone where it was written, Benjamin Crosby died in Africa in 1795. And it, it just, that it, you know, it prompted a question that I was not able to let go of. I couldn't move on from, you know, could these sea captains have been involved in the slave trade? And I think, you know, that that is that is one of the things that I'd love to, you know, impress upon people is, you know, we have not there this evidence, it is inscribed in our landscape. You know, it is in our cemeteries, it is in our historical societies. Um, yes, a lot of it has gone up in flames or, or, and, you know, a good deal of it was thrown overboard and buried, but evidence remains, um, almost you could say hiding in plain sight. Mm. And so if we're, you know, we've, we've so myself included, we've so internalized these stories, the stories of the brave intrepid Yankee mariners. Um, and we have so, we've loved these, this narrative that New England was staunchly on the right side of history, that we fought to end slavery um, and have, have really in, you know, in sort of blindly embracing those narratives and failing to question. Um, I, I think that we've ended up very alienated from our own history. You know, we've blinded ourselves in a way um, that is, um, it presents a real handicap. You know, in the South, in the American South, there are these plantations, the, the evidence of, of, of slavery, it's everywhere, right? Um, mm -hmm. Here in New England, however, we've, we're surrounded by these gorgeous sea captains' homes, which we can simply, you know, admire without uh, without recognizing or acknowledging that these two, these are our equivalent of plantations because they were built uh, through the profits that were generated from this investment in slavery. The difference is our investment and our involvement, it took place out of sight and out of mind. It took place, you know, overseas. And so there was this plausible deniability. Our guys could come home and they could wash their hands. And, uh, and you know, even if their wives knew, which I suspect they certainly did, but they, they didn't have to talk about it. And so that I think has become very much a New England trait. Shh, we don't talk about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Meadow. Thank you. History tends to repeat itself, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it sure it, does. It doesn't seem like, you know, we learn. The powers that be don't learn. Yeah. 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 Hi, Meadow. Um, thank you so much for doing this. You did such a great job. Thank you. I had, two, oh, I had two quick questions. Um, the first one is, how did you know that the yellow fever from the 10 brothers voyage was like that strand responsible for 
that national spread? So thank you for the question. I, this is important to underscore. I'm not claiming that the 10 brothers uh, was responsible for everything that happened in the Atlantic world that year in terms of uh, the pandemic of yellow fever. It certainly wasn't. Um, there were other vessels that were trading in West Africa right alongside the 10 brothers uh, that were other diseased ships, you could say, you know, where captains and crew members were getting sick and dying and then carrying that fever along to their next destination. Um, but I do, the, so the 10 brothers is a very special case, however, because of what happened when it got back to Boston. It's because the regulations were not enforced at quarantine. You know, if that vessel had actually performed quarantine the way it was meant to, um, then maybe we would be telling a very different story here. I'll give you an example. There was a, a similar vessel that arrived in uh, around the same time um, to, you know, a couple of weeks later in the port of New York. Um, and it was carrying yellow fever. That vessel was stuck at quarantine for over a month. And then when it was finally cleared to come into port, it came into port, but the authorities saw that, oh, no, there's still, there's still disease on board. So they sent it back to quarantine. None of that took place here in Boston, here in Boston. Where, um, the, uh, the officials, um, we have evidence of their corruption, you know, here in the Northeast. They were easy to pay off. Um, they were on the take. Thank you for clarifying that. That goes to people's earlier point about how history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. um, but my second question, and you touched on this a bit already, but what would you recommend for, his, for civil historians to learn more about Maine's complex history when there is gaps in that scholarship? Yeah, great question. Um, so Atlantic Black Box, the organization that, um, that I founded, in the wake of these discoveries <clears throat> um, was, was really the, the idea is to encourage people, just average citizens, you and me, uh, to do history actively. I think one of the things that this story shows is that we can't wait around for historians to tell us the truth of what happened here in New England because here it is 200 years later and the work hasn't been done. Cape Cod, for example, I come from Cape Cod. What did we do? How did we make our money? You can't farm on Cape Cod. Uh, sure, they clear cut, they sold all their trees to the West Indies, right? All that lumber um, that made a little bit of money for a while, but, uh, and we built some ships and we were involved in, in, in fishing and in whaling to some degree, but largely, yeah, I mean, all our entire economy was maritime. That's all we did. Now consider the fact that the last time a historian tried to write a comprehensive sort of history of Cape Cod's maritime trade was in 1935. And that was a book called Shipmasters of Cape Cod by Henry, K Henry Kittredge. Kittredge was a descendant of sea captains. Um, and that is often the case of folks who write about uh, New England's maritime history. They, they tend to be deeply invested. In fact, they often are, are descendants. Um, and so we have this sort of impartiality at the outset uh, I think. And so we, we can't wait for historians um, to do this work. There simply are not enough of them today. We unfortunately in our school systems, we've done a really bad job of um, selling history to young people. Um, and I point to, to myself uh, as, um, a, a, as a case study. I went for 
I went for literature. I went for fiction. I wanted, you know, fun stories, uh, right? And didn't didn't want the vegetables. I wanted the dessert, not the vegetables, right? Um, and yet I didn't realize that history needed me and history needs us. It needs all of us. Um, you know, one of our, uh, one of the things I will say is first, I hope you'll go, thank you, you know, Megan, for the question. I hope you'll go to the website, atlanticblackbox.com and you'll look at the resources we have there. I hope you'll considering become, you'll consider becoming a member um, because what we do is we try to empower people who don't have training in history to do history by you know, answering some basic questions about how do I get started? Where do I look? Um, what kinds of pitfalls am I likely to encounter at the historical society down the road? What should I be looking for? What do I make of this strange thing? How do I read 17th century handwriting? Um, you know, all of those things. We're a group, we're like a coalition of scholars, educators, activists, artists, descendants, genealogists, um, historical uh, experts, you know, historical society, um, you know, uh, directors and such, all coming together to help enlighten one another. And um, so, but I think it starts with curiosity. Just ask the basic questions about where you live, your town. How was my town complicit in this history? Go to your historical society and ask them, go to your reference librarian and ask what were our connections to Africa and the West Indies? Um, how did our greatest citizens, our most prominent citizens in the 18th and 19th centuries, how did they make their money? It, just follow the money. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Follow the money. Follow the money. Yeah. And, and, and if it's not pretty, we didn't talk about it. Yeah. Right. yeah. We, or maybe we even covered it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Meadow. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Very you much. so much, everyone. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you'll yeah, we'll keep it going. It was great. And I, I just wanted to say that when Meadow and I spoke before this program, we we talked about having her back in February to talk about some of our local history. And so I yes. hope that we can put that together and, and do something more local. Um, I just wanted to give a plug to our archivist too, since uh, we've, she's done a lot of content during COVID on how you can get started with local history. And we have a great website called biddifordhistory.com that you can look at old photographs. She's written some a great blog piece about the history of the library and Frederick Douglass. So I hope you can take time to look that up as well. And I hope we'll see uh, Meadow back in February. Yes. So thank, thank you all for thank joining you. us. Thank, thank you very much. Nice. Thank you, Meadow. So nice working with you. Thank you, Melanie. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for bringing her to us, Melanie. <laughs>